a sign of an idiot who thinks it's gone as far as it's never going to get better, so why bother? <laughs> Either way. <laughs> Well, we still have missing bodies, but we're going to go ahead and officially start. Uh, Good evening. Good evening. Jane Michaels, it's a pleasure to meet you. No, it's my pleasure. Great so for time. those of you who have never been here before, the LAMS is the oldest professional theatrical organization in the country. It started in London in 1869. We've been in New York since 1874. We move around a lot. This is our 14th home. We've been here now 42 years almost. Mm -hmm. And uh, my name is Mark Barron. I'm what we call the shepherd or the president of the lamps. And uh, we don't own the building, but we lease the floor. And we have all the facilities we want, which allows us to keep our dues very low. And we also have a foundation that's been supporting non education and the arts and nonprofit theater since 1943. Mm -hmm. It is uh, both the foundation and the lamps are run by all volunteers. Uh, some examples of things that happened at the Lambs, it was Lambs who founded little things like the Actors Fund of America. <laughs> Not so little. <laughs> yeah. That's a big deal. The big deal. Gap. Another big deal. Wow. Actors Equity. Wow. <laughs> wow. Paramount Pictures. Uh, we were also part of the founding of AFTRA, the March of Dimes, and most recently in the merger of SAG-AFTRA. Yes. We had two Lambs, three Lambs involved in that. And uh, our, uh, the foundation is supported mainly by bequests and donations. For example, uh, a, a couple of uh, songwriting hacks by the name of Lerner and Lowe <laughs> met at the Lambs Club. And as a result, Fred Lowe left the Lambs Foundation a piece of Brigadoon. Oh, wow. So that brings in a few, a few quid every year. Unfortunately, it's a part of Brigadoon that only appears every hundred years. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, we're, we're, praying for that. we're praying for the Broadway revival because that'll really short. But our foundation is helping. We we've given we have uh, grants and stuff, scholarships at AMDA. We're working now with the SAC found the set with the app, the Actors Equity Foundation to grant grant through that. So lots of things. So events like this fall under both the Lambs Club and the Lambs Foundation. Those few generous donations at the door go to our foundation to keep supporting that. Uh, after we talk, you're welcome to look around at the history on the walls on 145 plus years up on the walls. The pictures, most are all the men of the press presidents of the club. Uh, and that's enough about that because now we're into here this lovely lady. Uh, even though she's warmed up half the house now for 20 minutes. We're all warmed up. Uh, to help lead the discussion. Not that she needs it. <laughs> but uh, a member of the Lambs who happens to be also handling some of the PR for the Lambs, uh, Jay Michaels. Good evening. My apologies for being late. I, I decided to get into character uh, to, to meet someone from MASH by trying to park in Manhattan, <laughs> which is not dissimilar to a war zone. Um, uh, I, mu I, I have a confession to make. When, uh, when I was asked to do this, uh, I was vastly intimidated because I have a television icon sitting next to me. Um, my confession is not so much the vastly intimidated, but the guilt that I thought, just the television icon. And when I did a little research, I realized that what we have with us a guest who has a vast and wonderful theatrical career, who has uh, had her hand in the who's who of television and film, so that when she might mention some of the series she's on, I guarantee we will have a sea of, <gasps> really, throughout the room. And, and uh, a dedicated and wonderful philanthropist. So my confession is I'm guilty that I didn't know such wonderful things, and I'm thrilled to be able to be here and chat with her about this, and I'm thrilled to share it with all of you. Uh, about being intimidated, now I'm doubly intimidated. <laughs> and um, she's a painter. Well, that's, oh, that's, that's the philanthropic thing that, uh, that, that, that will come up quite easily. Um, please feel free. I'm going to make this interactive. I'll ask a couple of questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand, anything like that. Um, uh, let, let's start at the top. Where did it all begin? Uh, I, I read that you studied to be a stenographer or something like that. No, no, no. That was um, to put myself through school. Uh -huh. I didn't, you know. Um, I went to Catherine Gibbs, so oh, that I nice. always had uh, sort of uh, that to pull back on. Although I, uh, I had a, a teacher, a mentor, really, 
who said it was always good if you didn't have something to fall back on mm -hmm. because you worked harder and you were relentless. But um, I uh, always wanted to be an actor. That was the first thought I had in my head. And what was different was I said I was going to be an actor. I didn't say I didn't say uh, I want to or or I will uh, try to be or I will study or. I don't know if you even need these. Uh, but anyway, um, I was uh, so sure that that was my niche that I just went for it. You know? As well you should. And as well I, I should. I gather you didn't need the fallback plan at any point. Uh, no, just um, when I left my home and um, came to New York. It's not a big trip. I was born in New Jersey and I was <laughs> in school in New Jersey, so it's like not a big trip. And I, that was lucky, I think, because um, it would have been tougher for me in, being in Idaho or Wyoming or something because I didn't have uh, much to go on, I, you know. And uh, uh, so I um, got a job as a secretary and I uh, put myself through schools and uh, while I studied, I joined a, a group called the Kelly Girls. The Kelly Girls, I don't know if they are still around. They're not? Yeah, what a shame because it was a great organization who got you temporary jobs. You worked by the hour and it was perfect for me if I had an audition or a class or, you know, so it was wonderful. And I had the most interesting jobs. I worked for Elsa Maxwell. Do, do, is anybody going to remember yes. Elsa yes. Maxwell? Yes. Next to Pearl Messer, I guess she was the party giver the whole time, and a sweet, wonderful lady. I adored her, and um, I. She lived at the Drake Hotel, and uh, she had a column, and so I would type the column, and I would. Uh, she'd send me sometimes to a restaurant. I don't think it's here anymore. Pavillon. It was the oh, restaurant yes. in the '60s. Pavillon. Henri Soule was the uh, manager and the maître. And, and one day she sent me there with um, place cards. And she drew it on the table and she had everything, you know. So this kid, I'm like 16, 17, and I, I go into this incredible restaurant. And I, he must have thought, oh, what a cute little kid, you know. So um, we put down the place cards and he said, you must stay for lunch. And we had. Um, Asparagus hollandaise and mum's champagne. <laughs> and I was as sick as a puppy. <laughs> I got to the, the, the Drake and I was just so ill. And for years I didn't have asparagus. And then I realized it was not the asparagus, it was the champagne. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a great job. I worked for the ambassador to Ghana, Alexander Kezonsaki. So I went to the UN parties and stuff, uh, um, and uh, ironically also met um, many people that Elsa knew. Uh, it was very exciting working for her. You never knew who was going to fly into the suite, you know, to CZ Guest, or I mean, just um, Prince Ali Khan was her very, very dearest friend. And uh, yeah, so it was just uh, startling uh, to, and I think, I was too young to really be really dazzled. I mean, now I look back and I thought, my God, I was like, how fantastic that was. She was the most generous human being I have ever met in my life. She had no she, no sense of money or whatever. She just, <laughs> Prince Ali Khan gave her a diamond comb. And it was one of those combs you, you, you know, put in, and uh, somebody admired it uh, at a party in the ladies' room. They were fluffing, and they said, what a lovely comb. She said, oh, do you like it? She took it off and gave it to her. Yeah. And, and she just never thought about it. I mean, she just was amazing. Uh, and, and I loved her dearly. I just really loved her a lot. Anyway, that's great. So, so that's what I was doing, putting myself through school. But mostly I stayed with um, Gene Frankel. I, I, Loved him. He was a great teacher. Oh, yes. His school, his school is still an inspiration. I, I teach there sometimes. <laughs> that makes it even more of an inspiration. There you go. Uh, it's funny you talk about the Kelly girls. Temping was a huge thing for actors 
in the 80s and 90s, especially, there was an agency that I dealt with called Temporarily Yours. And I used to get such a kick out of that name. Um, that's clever. That's nice. Good. Ironically, it was run by an ex-actress, so of course there'd be some, some creativity to it. You had in an interview very recently, uh, you spoke about MASH as being your family, and you had an excellent line. You had said, we are family in its most sincere form. As opposed to being fans and saying, oh, how is it with the show? Let's go there. How is it? How is your family? How is it to uh, be sincere? In, in its most sincere form, meaning uh, your family, you, you, they're thrust upon you. You don't have much of a choice and you try to get along. <laughs> you, you know, you get together for holidays and you pretend to be happy and whatever. So um, in its most sincere form, I meant we would seek each other out on weekends when we didn't have to work together. We would go out to lunch together or dinner or I babysat. I mean, I, the, the, all the children grew up with me, you know, even Beatrice and, and my Elizabeth. And um, uh, we were just, um, we grew up together. And the tapestry of, of events that happened in the world and to us um, is indelible. So you, you just are so bonded. And with your losses, I think you get even closer. We've lost many of our numbers. Um, McLean, Stephen, of course, uh, Stevenson was first, and then Larry Linville, Harry, Harry Morgan, and most recently Wayne Rogers and Bill Christopher, and, and just the most recent loss David was David Stiers. Yeah. So, um, um, but uh, Jamie, <laughs> Jamie. Uh, said to me, you know, sweat, you know, that wonderful voice, sweat, you know, it's us, we're left, we're, left. we're the only ones left we've got. There's me, and then there's Alan, you, Mike, and Gary, and that's it. I said, that was by order of what? He said, age. He <laughs> 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 is so delightful. <laughs> uh, a kind of uh, private note, he is an exquisite dresser. He should be on the cover of GQ. And there he is running around <laughs> looking like Scarlett O'Hara. And, and you know, it, it was so ironic. And we had a running gag rehearsal days. Of course, I came in my civilians. And I uh, had my civvies. He would, come, he would come up to me and sort of finger a blouse and say, is that one of mine? <laughs> so we, we had this funny, Funny running gag, so many, so many of them. Anyway, it was I saw him years ago in 1992, uh, I think, in Guys and Dolls on Broadway. Uh, yes, it was Nathan Detroit, and uh, talk about icon. For the first half of it, I'm looking at him and saying, "What's wrong with this?" Oh, he's in a suit. I guess the gorgeous in it too. It was the hairy legs, as far as I'm concerned. He was a great Nathan, Nathan Detroit. Oh, he's excellent. Oh, wow, he was excellent. I think he was the last one. I think he closed. I think he was uh, at the end of the run. Of uh, it's about. possible. I just I remember. Uh, well, I saw it twice. Uh, we we do that. We see everything with each other. We you know run around and and uh, I'm flying tomorrow to Los Angeles. My friend Mike Farrell's getting an award, oh, and wow. so uh, that's I'm going to be there. Oh, that's great. And then uh, the day after that, Alan is getting an award, which I can't do. Uh, he's getting a, a film award, I think, from yeah, the Hampton, Hampton Film Festival. I was actually going to ask you if you were going to go. I, I, would, I would love to. Oh, yeah, yeah, I would love to. But we're we're neighbors here, actually, oh, so right. I get to see him. Yeah, I get to see him. And Arlene is a terrific woman. You still live in New York? I live in New York, yes. That's great. That's great. It you is great. New Jersey. I love this city. I love this city so much. Every, I love like the weird things about it. I love the noise and the dirt and the, yeah, I mean, it just, it's embarrassing. I love this city. There's a television show now that, uh, that covers New York in the 70s, uh, ah. The Juice. And, and when I look at that and I wistfully look at New York in the 70s and I'm thinking, am I crazy yeah. to wistfully look at, well, <laughs> yes, New York is definitely that kind of place. Uh, we're, we're talking about MASH, we're talking about that. You still, obviously, you've answered my other question, you still keep in touch. Oh yeah, you're it's more than the family. in touch, yeah. I mean, when people say, uh, do you ever talk to them, I say, are you kidding? It's like, um, we, um, at any given time, if you say, um, 
what's Gary doing or where's Gary now or something, I can tell you. Oh, sure. You know, it's a, it's a blessing. Uh, it's, I write an homage in this book. Uh, we were presented with this absolutely stunning lithograph uh, by Fox um, on our 10th anniversary, our 10th year. And so I put it in the book. Uh, it's an art book. I didn't paint it, but, but it belongs there. And it gave me an opportunity to talk about how much I love these people and how swell they are. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, MASH plus your other television works, uh, as you look back on them now, as I said at the beginning, you, you, you were on Gunsmoke, you were on so many of the ones that, that we call the Golden Age, if you will, part of the Golden Age. How does it feel when you look back on, on television? Uh, what it was, what it is, how it felt to be there? Uh, I was blessed uh, in so many ways. I, uh, I have been doing MAME in Las Vegas with Susan Hayward. Susan Hayward was my MAME. And that was a trip. What a great, wonderful lady. And um, I, uh, I had a girlfriend I had done a play with uh, in California. And she called me. She said, you can't just run back to New York. You're working so hard. You know, in Las Vegas, then you did two shows a day, seven days a week. But you, you loved what you were doing. So um, uh, she said, come and uh, you know, spend a few weeks. Maybe meet somebody. You get television work or something. So I went. and. Um, I went up to see a casting director at CBS, and she, uh, in those days, you carried around this book. Remember, Joni, you carried around a portfolio, and you showed everybody your work, you know, like, this is me doing that. So uh, she's looking through my book, and she sees, um, what did she see, Gooch? No, no. Anyway, uh, she's looking through my book. She's, I know you, I know you. I said, I'm nobody. You don't know me. I know, I know you. And then she came to Gooch. There was a picture of me with Susan. I was Agnes Gooch. And um, that's it. She said, that's, that's it. Uh, you, while you're here, you need to call Fred Amzell. Does that ring an old bell with you? He's gone now, but he was such a great agent. He was a real Damon Runyon character. He never called me anything but uh, uh, kid, kid. Okay, kid. I got an, an interview for you, kid. And, you know, I loved him. He was just so Damon Runyon. <laughs> so, so um, she said he's very laid back, and he was sitting in my office raving about you. He had gone to Vegas to to see Susan, but he's oh this kid. <laughs> this kid playing good. She was terrific. She was so good. She was terrific, and so. It, it, it impressed her because it, it, I wasn't his client, and he didn't know, and you know, so it was so real, it stuck in her head. So when she met me and she heard the name, she was, you know, and then she saw the picture. She called me in to read for Gunsmoke, which became my first television movie. And I had, again, a blessing, Richard Leacock, wonderful British director, directed me in my first, you know, so it was like, wow, this is great. I'll tell you what, what a great director he was. He took me out to lunch with William Watson, who was my love interest in, in the movie, and um, he said to us at lunch, he said, I think it's ever so much nicer to have lunch first before you meet tomorrow, shake hands and hop into bed to do the love scene. <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, he was just so, he was so civilized. <laughs> but I, I did love him and it was a wonderful episode and it uh, got a lot of attention. Of course, everybody loved Gunsmoke. But uh, CBS then sort of became aware of me. The lovely story that I didn't find out until way later was on Gunsmoke, uh, Doc, the, the old guy who played Doc, no. he called himself the Star Spangled Banger. <laughs> such a, Millie, Millie, his name was Millie, uh, Milburn Stone, but everybody called him Millie. And um, he, unknown, uh, did not know about this, called the casting director of Paramount, Millie Gussie, also lost to us now, but he said, there's a gal on the show this week who's really good, she's, she's really got something. I think, I think you should meet with her. And 
that was my entry to Paramount. And a show came up, uh, Maddox, and she thought I was right for the role. She called me in. Michael O'Hurley, another wonderful director that I had a chance to work with, cast me in a role, and it was a CBS show. I'm, I'm emphasizing that because eventually, when I was called in about MASH, I had done all this work for CBS, and in fact, one of the shows was at Fox, the CBS show that Fox did with Glenn Ford. It was a short live series, but anyway, got a lot of attention. It was a premiere show, Darren McGavin, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, so um, I was, somebody up there was taking care of me. I now had uh, building up these credits. The third job I had was Hawaii Five-0, mm -hmm. oh, oh, CBS, and very popular. So these, these three shows were really in, like the top five or whatever. And it was very important to, uh, to try to be in those shows. That was wonderful. That's wonderful. And as I said, you all went, ooh, ah, just like I said. You know, <laughs> how's it different now? Looking uh, at it, uh, being part of the television, what's what's different? From from my point of view, or because because now you don't you don't get uh, much of an opportunity to go in and read for things and try to get them, or you know, you, there's not a lot of um, there's not too much an agent can do anymore. Um, you're they'll submit a picture, and then if you're called in, they put your audition on tape. Uh, it's badly lit, worse than this even. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and you're reading with uh, somebody who, who can't talk, and so uh, it's, it's difficult. And, and you don't feel you've been up to bat. But when, when this all happened, I read for uh, Philip Leacock, I read for Michael O'Hurley, I read for Jack Lord and, and uh, Marvin Chomsky. See, it, the names are indelible because the, all of that was just so wonderful and so important. And uh, Marvin Chomsky uh, was, I'll, I'll, I'll always be thankful for, for that job because um, the producer wanted somebody else. The producer had another show that was premiering, and he wanted to start pushing the, the lead, the lady uh, who was doing that show, he wanted to start getting her out there on different things so that when she debuted in the other show, she was known. And um, and I'm, I'm sure she was fine, I'm sure, but, but uh, Marvin thought, I sat down for the interview with Marvin, and he said, so, how do you look in a bikini? <laughs> and I said, oh, this character would not wear a bikini. <laughs> I don't, I, whatever, I don't know, I was serious. I don't know why I didn't just laugh and say terrific or, I don't know. I was already <laughs> into the job. I said, I don't think this character will wear a bikini. That was it. He said, and he told me later, I knew you knew this character. And she wouldn't. She was very shy, she was, you know. So, um, I, it's funny that things that happen that uh, are, are really a blessing and, and you have no control over them. They just evolve and they happen. And, and Jack became a very dear friend. He, uh, we worked the same way, we were both met then, you know, so anyway. And it was uh, a very large, very large part, very big part, very important part, and very demanding. Lots of, you know, hysterics and his and I'll tell you a funny story about my parents, who were very much against my uh, becoming an actress. And so now I'm on television. It's it's getting a little better for them to accept. And my dad gets on the phone. The Hawaii Five O has just been on, and. It, he was very moved by the performance, and he's, oh, called me sis, oh sis, oh, oh sis, you just, oh, it was, uh, you, you were, uh, I said, uh, yeah, dad, what, what? Said, I, 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 so my, my mother grabs the phone, and she says, what did they do to your eyebrows? <laughs> so the contrast between them is so, so dramatic, but uh, they were, they were really funny. <laughs> But that they, they eventually uh, taught me everything I know. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? It went from don't you dare to I taught her everything she knows. <laughs> Especially my mom. When Hawaii 5 happened, that's it. Now there's, now there's permission. 
That's great. That's great. Let's let's go into the theater. Tell us about your life in the theater. Sure. The theater. Uh, my my life in the theater sort of began before television. You have to understand, I'm an older person. Television, when I was in New York studying and um, typing at Kelly Girls, I um, uh, television was in its infancy. Um, you had Dave Garraway. You have uh, you, you didn't have the Muppets. You had Mr. Green Jeans. You had so it's it and you um, everybody was and, dead. And, yeah, they're all gone. Captain Kangaroo. So uh, I, I did a Captain Kangaroo. So don't have anybody snicker about that. So so um, so everything was theater, 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 and and that's all. I thought about anyhow, and Jean had a little uh, repertory theater company, and and um, we did different plays. Sometimes we'd do plays out of the uh, the workshop the writers had, or but uh, it was it was great. It was like dying and going to heaven for me. And uh, there was a big fish bowl. You could put a couple bucks in for the actors, and uh, we were all living on black coffee, and uh, you would you would you would. You would walk, I would walk. I lived in the village in a sixth floor walk up. And believe me, wow. you develop a memory. You never forget anything. Yeah. Because once you're up there and you don't have milk, you, you know, so, uh, so it, really, it really works for you. And then, um, you want to you, you come, come forward if you want? Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Don't be shy. Okay. Um, and I would walk from the village to 72nd Street for my free singing lesson. And it didn't mean anything. You develop exercise and health yeah. that way, too. Yeah, and, ver and varicose veins. But, but uh, we did that. We never thought about it. We ate at Tad's Steakhouse for $1.99. You got this incredibly bad piece of meat, a baked potato, with incredibly bad sauce over it, uh, a garlic bread, a piece of garlic bread. It just, it was heaven. And then you would walk home. I, I weighed 110 pounds, soaking wet, and naked, soaking wet. I was, and my mother said, Lester, she grabs my father. Look at her, she's so skinny. I can count her ribs. <laughs> you um, talk about being Agnes Gooch, you were also Maine. Yeah, eventually. I went up for the part of um, Sally Cato, who's that firebrand of a you yes. probably pick later. Um, oh. That uh, hot firebrand who has a crush on Beauregard, whom, whom Mame is going to marry. So uh, I went up for Sally, and because I was the right age range, and um, I, um, I read, and Gene Sachs came to the edge of the stage and he said, uh, honey, uh, that was good, that was good, but um, see, we have to have Sally understudy Maine, and you're too young uh, to do Maine. That is the last time anyone ever said that to me. <laughs> so, it was, I, so I remember this clearly. I was never too young for a part again after that. So uh, he said, well, what I want you to do is go home and study Gooch. I want you to do the, the, the uh, Gooch's lament, you know, when she comes in pregnant and she asks Mae what she what should she do now. And she said, and then and then you'll read for Gooch. And I said, okay, fine. And I called my then agent and I told him and he said, I was so hoping maybe that would be something that would happen because I knew you you couldn't they wouldn't consider you for, for Mae. And so um, I uh, went in and I sang, and uh, I, he, um, and I got the job. Uh, it was very interesting. There were five producers to the original show, and um, they they thought I was too young and too pretty. Uh -huh. And um, Gene who was a great fan. He took the script, put it down at the meeting with them, and said. If you can find one page in the script that says Gooch is old and ugly, mm -hmm. I will listen to you. Mm -hmm. And they said, yeah, but, but he said, no, there's no buts. You're saying she's too young, she's too pretty. I'm saying 
Gooch is peculiar. <laughs> this girl is peculiar. <laughs> this girl can be peculiar. <laughs> but I loved working with him. He was an actor's director. He was a good actor, so of course he, he knew the language. He knew how to bring out the best in what you had. You're also a pigeon sister. I was a pigeon sister. Yes. The odd yes. couple with Ernest Borgnine. Oh, I had lots of odd couples. Ernie was one of them. Dear Ernie, we were good friends. Uh, Ernie, Bar uh, Ernie and Don Rickles. Is that an oh, odd oh another couple God. for you? Oh, now, this is interesting. Don was letter perfect. You would think, you know, he had this incredible stand-up comedy routine and very successful. <coughs> Didn't change a comma. Such a good actor, such a good actor. And of course, Ernie was too. But they, they were very funny together, the two of them. It was a cute, a cute match. Um, I did it with E.G. E. G. Marshall, was uh, one of my guys, Dennis O'Keefe, um, Shelley Berman. Mm -hmm. Shelley Byrne was an interesting uh, Oscar. He was very interesting. Anyway, so I had a lot of uh, odd guys, uh, a lot great. of odd couples. That's great. Um, I'm not sure whether it's your favorite part, but I know it's something you'd like to explore again. Eleanor Roosevelt? Oh, why would you think it's not my favorite part? <laughs> I, I, I'm just guessing. Oh, I worship this woman. I didn't want to say, oh, woman. it's your favorite. Uh, I know, um, I worship this woman. Oh, my God. The more I, the more I learned about her, the more, you know, she was... She was, well, I mean, we owe everything that we have today to her. And you know, we, we got to keep working on getting a little more. But the, the thing is, she was, she was amazing, so brilliant, so insightful and visionary. I have a lovely uh, little story about Eleanor. I was, uh, where did I do it? Oh, no, I wasn't doing I was doing a play with Harry Hamlin. And uh, my neighbor, this was in California, Los Angeles, and my neighbor who saw me in the last show, it was Harry, uh, we had dogs who were walking our dogs, and she said, I love this show, and uh, how is he to work, but he's fine. Blah, blah, blah. Now, so what's next, she said. I said, I'm going to be doing Eleanor. And she said, Roosevelt? And, but it was such a big reaction. I thought, there's a story here. Yeah. You knew immediately. I said, yes. <laughs> and she said, oh, you must talk to my husband. <laughs> the word for Eleanor Roosevelt, my husband wouldn't be here. And we wouldn't have this legacy of kids and their kids and their kids' kids. Because Eleanor was responsible for bringing him from Europe as a child. He was 14. Wow. And she uh, uh, commissioned a boatload of Jewish children. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, and, and I did meet him. I was, do you have any stories? Oh, yeah. I was always uh, fascinated by things that, and I met her granddaughter. Her granddaughter came to see me do Eleanor in Chicago at, at, uh, at the Roosevelt Theater. So, so it's, uh, oh no, she's, wow, she's very, very meaningful. And I love doing that kind of way out character work. You look at me and you say, you played Eleanor. I'll show you some pictures of me playing Eleanor and it's, uh, yeah. What I did was, yeah, my girlfriend knows that. Yeah. What I did was paint her face. I'm an artist. I painted her face on my face. And then we had an appliance to give wow. me that, you know, the, the teeth. And, uh, and the costumes are so wonderful. They're so Eleanor. You just know she would wear something like that. Yeah. And then I began to study film on her, her voice, mm. and her walk. and. Uh, Oh, crazy about her. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I was looking at pictures today, actually, of you in that role, and I had to blink. Because I <laughs> yeah, like, thank you. Is that, oh, wow. <laughs> Which one is that? Is that? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I was yeah. like, okay, well, is this a real thing? Wait a second. You absolutely transformed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely transformed you know, into that role. A, 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 an artist sees things uh, differently. I, and I grew up with art. I mean, I, I started sketching when I was a kid. And uh, I won my first art prize when I was six. It was just sketching and doodling, and I, st I still, uh, I remember um, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, my boyfriend and I were sitting watching a movie, and I, 
picked something up and I started sketching and he grabbed it from me and put it down. He said, can you just do nothing? Can you just stop, just watch this movie or talk to me and stop doing it? And I was, I was just, I was a serial doodler. <laughs> I always thought that's just like a sign of creativity, that, yeah. that you can't just... Or madness. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's a thin line between genius and madness. I'm crazy. Uh, yes. Well, you've given me the perfect segue. I was thinking, how am I going to segue into her fine art? Well, there you go, talking about doodling. We're there. Tell us, please, about, obviously, your love of animals, and obviously, more about you as a fine art. Well, um, I've grown considerably since the sketch that mom... I, I begged my mother to submit this sketch in to this contest. I mean, it was nothing, really. But um, I won. And I remember the prize was this adorable little mystery bank. You had to read instructions on how it opened. And, you know, well, this is adorable. But I won. That was the whole yeah. point. <laughs> Who cares about the gift? And um, I don't know that it... Um, it never occurred to me that this is what I would do eventually. Or, um, but as I got older, I kept painting and doodling and so forth. And my very, very dearest friend in the whole world, who's been dead now quite a few years, uh, MS uh, claimed her. Uh, she was the dearest human being in the world. Uh, un unbelievable kind. Madeline Rue, beautiful actress, yeah. beautiful actress. She was one of the Ryan Gold girls. She's just gorgeous, very talented, very talented. She, we, we did a movie together, and I remember the, um, the director, um, we were watching Rushes, and he said, look at that. She tells you, she, she tells you everything with just that look. She was an unhappy wife, and as her husband passed her at the cocktail party, she kind of kind of looked at like, why don't you stay and talk with me a little bit, honey, or I don't, she, there was a world going on with just the way she, and, and he so appreciated that when he was an actor also, so. Um, but um, uh, Madeline studied art, and she had no idea that um, when I was alone, I was doing all this stuff. When we were going to dinner once, she was running behind, I, I arrived at her house, she says, um, I, I'm going to hop in the shower, I'll be about 10 minutes. Here. And she hands me one of her drawing pads and says, amuse yourself. As a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I did this sketch. And she came out and she <laughs> looked at it and she said, what? <laughs> so it's also very funny. What? She said, are you kidding me? <laughs> I've been studying for years and you did that. What you want? What? And she was like frosting at the mouth. <laughs> she was so adorable. And um, shortly afterwards, opened the door of my house. It's a little stoop outside. And there stands a beautiful easel with a big bow around it. It was Christmas time and it was from Madeline because she wanted me. She said, you can't just like do this and not do it. She says, you can't, you know. And so uh, she was really the force behind me spreading out more. I started working in acrylics uh, for a while, but I was always uh, into watercolor. And she, it's, it's the most difficult medium to work in. But I didn't know that. So I just plunged into watercolor. And I, I always relate it to the bumblebee theory, where the bumblebee, by aeronautical standards, and the width, the breadth, the span of the wings, the body weight, and so forth, should not be able to fly. That's just, just it's like science and biology and everything. But the bumblebee doesn't know that. So it goes ahead and flies. And that's, I really think, I didn't, I didn't know watercolor was, you know, so I just, you know, an artist was saying, why do you do watercolor? It's so difficult. It is? You know, I was like, oh my God. But you don't want to know that. You know, it's good that you don't know that. Just do it. Um, Eleanor says, things that need to be done usually can be done. And I, I, I believe that's true. I think, I think passion, relentless passion, takes us uh, a long ways, you know. Anyway. I'm hearing you say, oh, it was nothing really about your first sketch, and yet you, you, 
Oh yeah, it, no, it really was. I mean, we're talking. It wasn't a figure; it was a face, but it, akin to stick figure. I mean, it was. It was I was six, for goodness sakes. It wasn't a Rembrandt. No, it was just. Um, <laughs> it was just this this cute thing, and I and I and I liked it. It they gave you this to draw, you know, this thing, and so I showed it to my mom, and I said, "Please, mom, send it in," you know. And, my mother was such a uh, complex human being. She threw herself across the door to stop me from leaving to go to New York and become an actress. And yet, my mother was responsible for sending me to dance classes. I took, I took ballet and tap as soon as I could walk. I had a lot to do with why my feet are in bad shape now. I, I mean, she, I was a cheerleader, I was a majorette, she sent me uh, to the Y to learn how to swim because it gave you confidence and all. And then suddenly she said, wait a minute, I wasn't, I didn't mean that, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm taking all that back, you know, <laughs> it's too late, mom. Actually, well, it wasn't that so much as, um, it wasn't that so much as uh, my first job as a teenager was working as a page in the public library in Passaic, New Jersey, the Julius Forstman Library. And um, I would bring home books. I got, I think, my reading habits uh, probably from my father. My father and I would read a book a day. I mean, we just we were relentless. And I would say, you know, you're very young, you don't need any sleep. Uh, I would uh, put a light under the blanket and I'd read all night and get up, you know, two hours and run to school and still get A's, you know, just you're young. And so um, I would do every character in the book I was reading, you know, plant life, anything, animals, <laughs> man, woman, child. And during my first real serious drama class, I found out that I had been rehearsing all my life. I was using stuff from myself, which if you really wanted to find the method, that's what they teach you to do. You use the components that you have, your elements, your passions and so forth, what touches you or whatever. You learn to use your body, your instrument. And I was doing that at a very young age. I just didn't have a name for it. Um, just like I was painting um, a basket of white roses and this friend of mine said, oh, so you're using negative space. <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> and I, but so I learned what that, but I, it's great because it's been a, a learning process for me. And it's wonderful for me to, um, to look at some of my old work and, and watch the progression. I, I feel that I get better with each painting, actually. And I get bolder, I get um, um, more ambitious. I'll take on, like there's one in here of a turkey, and uh, I, it's, it's glorious, I call it glorious. The colors and the feathers, and you know, so. Anyhow, so that's my story so far. <laughs> Why now? Why now well, the art book? Uh, well, uh, it, it, it was an accident. I never would have gone to somebody and say, uh, you know, a publisher. Or, I would never say, you know, I'm an artist and I have this, uh, these art paintings and, and I would like to do a book or would you like to do a book? I would never, ever have done that. But a guy who was in publishing saw my work. Uh, we were on a private plane together with our mutual friends. Um, uh, I had just come uh, out of Florida where my friends flew me to get an award from the American Red Cross for, for humane work. And I was you know, really euphoric. I'm sitting there with my American Red Cross award. And I have a lot of my work on my computer. So I was going through my computer and he was sitting close by and he was sort of rubbernecking and he said, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's very good. And I said, that's mine. Oh, you, you did that? What about the others? And, and, and slowly but surely he um, became enamored of the work and he said, this is a book. I said, no, no, these are my pages. No, this is a book. He said, you want a book? You want to do a book? I, yeah, sure. <laughs> I <was> like, <laughs> Who is that man? Anyway, I, uh, that's how that came about. 
the expression though of kind of, and coming full circle, it's making money to fund my my charity, which is about animals. So most of the work uh, is uh, animal life, and um, there are a few florals, which is kind of animal life to me. And um, uh, so um, I I'm doing what I love. And I'm saluting my MASH family. I mean, there's so many things that are a complete circle for me in the expression of this book. But um, the, the byline is very accurate. It's the watercolor artistry and animal activism of Loretta Swain. And I think that that really says, says it. That's what it is. Mm. And, uh, and I'm just, I'm totally thrilled. I'm working on book two. I was about to ask you that. Is, is, there, is there a sequel? Uh, yeah, there will be. Uh, I'll, I'll keep. I mean, as long as people want it, you know. That's that's the thing. Um, actors generally don't really retire. As long as you 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 yeah. want us, we'll, we'll we'll keep doing it, right, Joe? We'll, we're there. We're we're ready to do our little thing, whatever. Uh, I think it's uh, it's a real romance. You know the dedicated actors. It's uh, it's a love affair. I always had a love affair with the theater. It was my first love, still is. Um, people, personal. I love hearing and seeing, and I, I feel the breath of the audience. And and they tell you what to do, where you go, what's they. It's it's a love affair. If I'm on stage alone and there's no audience, I'm a person. If nobody's on stage and you're out there, you're a mob. Yeah. But together, we make magic. Mm -hmm. uh, very well said. Very well said. Uh, questions, and I'll open the floor at this point. We've we've gone through the the life of Loretta Swain. Questions? Yes, yes, You've done uh, theater and you know live theater and television. And my observation is that I wanted to get your, your feedback on this. The difference between acting on TV, I, I watch what they call the blooper reels, and how they get to do it over and over and over again until they get it right for the shot. If you're on stage, you roll with whatever happens. Do you have do you have a preference, or is live theater your favorite? And or what do you feel about that different dynamic between oh, you know, the TV actors they could just do it over and over again, and if you're on stage, guess what? Right, you can't. Uh, you can do it over and over and over again uh, if you're doing a three camera show, which Mash was not. Mash ah. was shooting a movie. I didn't mean Mash. So, I mean Mash was like a real ensemble uh, okay. piece of theater. But. I've I've done some three camera, and it's fun. It's okay. Uh, for me, um, the the quality of doing Mash, for example, on film for television is, is exquisite. You get the texture. And, um, the challenge, and and by the way. Film is expensive. You don't get to do it over and over and over. Yeah. You no, know, you you better do it. You better right. yeah. okay. you better pay attention. You better come in knowing your lines and yeah. and uh, and don't trip over the cables. <laughs> um, well, Howard actually yeah. said that. Yeah. Know your lines and don't trip over and the don't furniture. Trip over right. furniture. Right. Um, well, I'll talk about theater first. This is my first love. Um, the demands are different. The demands are. What I love, I love the discipline. Julie Andrews, one of my favorite people, said uh, she was liberated through discipline. And I believe that's true. Uh, she, um, uh, you get freedom if you're that disciplined. You're free. You're liberated. There's nothing you can't do. So I love, I love the discipline of the theater. I love signing in. I love. I'm, I'm there an hour before, half hour, because it's my home, it's, I, it's my church, it's what I love. Um, I love the preparation. I love rehearsing. Now, you have a longer period to rehearse when you're doing theater, obviously, weeks sometimes, out of town, whatever. That's the time when you can really develop the character, find things, find, you know, so that's exciting. Opening is like flying without a net to me, and that's challenging because it's scary and it's wonderful. Uh, being alone on stage, as I am several times, uh, Shirley Valentine, she's alone. Eleanor is alone. Uh, I got to do Shirley Valentine for so long, uh, 
I was starting to worry about how I would relate to a partner on stage because I was oh, so used yeah. to, because you're doing everything. You're choreographing yourself. You're, doing, you're, you're cueing yourself. You're doing everything. You're sometimes, in Shirley, reacting to yourself. You're doing your yeah. kids. You're imitating your kids. You're imitating your husband. You're using different voices. You're making them laugh. Sometimes you're relating to the audience. If you're in and out, be that, be, you know. So she is the ultimate challenge also because she changes. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end to Shirley. She evolves, and you have to be ready to end up that changed person because the audience, you take them on a journey. Mm -hmm. They watch her evolve. They watch her grow up, and they share everything with her, her laughs, her hopes, and her tears. And she's she can be very, very touching. And um, so, so that's like so exciting. Now, uh, MASH, the undercurrent of that show always was that we were exhausted. We always had to remind, we always told each other, we're exhausted. These people were heroes. I mean, they would put bodies together until four in the morning and just fall into their cots for two hours and there'd be more helicopters. It was brutal, brutal. The conditions were brutal, brutal. They were, it's the coldest spot on the planet in the winter, Korea. And in the summer, the hottest. You are bedding down with mice, rats, fleas, snakes. It's horrible, it's horrible. And, and um, the women volunteered to be there. They were not drafted. That's what I always talk about in this number me too. Do you know how strong and, and incredible women are? So there they were in Korea doing doing the hardest kind of work. We used to say we're patching we're patching boys together who aren't old enough to shave. You're you're just standing in blood. You're hot and sweaty or you're freezing. And there's no kind of I guess there's a tiny spring somewhere there, but I've been to Korea in the winter, and trust me, they would keep putting these hot spots in, in my gloves because I couldn't move my hand, it was so cold. There was a flag that weighed 400 pounds, an American flag, that was in the sky, uh, it, not a ripple. The wind chill had it, taken out every ripple. It was just plastered across the sky. That's how they knew how cold it was. And so it's, it's amazing cold. Statistically, um, the killer, the killer in Korea was uh, number one, uh, frostbite. Number two, snake bite. Number three, the, the police action. It's number three that, that killed our boys, but the other. So you can imagine what, what was, so we would, as an undercurrent always, this is what was going on. That's why the humor was so good. So but because, and that's why we, you accepted how crazy they were. Because they had to be. It was the only way to be sane. You had to be crazy to be sane. And, and you're cleaner. I mean, it justified. I mean, he wants to do anything to, yeah, I watched him. The other night, he was a nun. He came, in, he came into Potter's office dressed as a nun. <laughs> and I just fell off my chair. It was, so, it was so clinger. And that character is based on a true story, it's a, a based on a true person, Lenny Bruce, the comic. Tried, he did that for real, trying to get out of the army. Okay, so now you're working with those elements as an actor. Uh, it affects how you walk. It affects everything. You're, you're, you don't spring across the compound because you're exhausted. And also the, 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 the relationships. Uh, Margaret um, was, um, I think, a feminist before they coined the word. This was the 50s, and women were not quite as strong and powerful as Margaret was. And uh, 
it uh, was um, my job to, um, I guess, make make that make that believable, make her um, show her self worth. Uh, the first three seasons, we saw how lonely she was, hooked up with Larry Linville, hooked up with that wonderful actor, but well, that kind of they they kept writing him uh, sillier and sillier. And Margaret, uh, brighter and brighter, she also was in awe of the doctors, uh, a great doctor who really captured her respect, even if they didn't respect her, like the way Hawkeye and Trapper and then BJ would just, uh, but that changed a lot too. Um, so there was no reason for her to be in this relationship but for what? Loneliness? loneliness. Um, I had the opportunity to work with uh, the writers about that. Uh, so the excitement there would be my, my sitting down and saying, this is what I see for her future. How about we do this? Could we try that? And so forth and so on. And as my character changed, the other characters had to adjust around that. They stopped calling her Hot Lips because she became more than one part of her anatomy. And it even, uh, and it reflected everywhere. Now, Alan wrote an episode, a two-parter for us, called Comrades in Arms. And he wrote it a long time before we actually did it. Why? Because he felt the audience wasn't ready to accept our falling into each other's arms. But by that time, it was believable. We, we saw that happen. We knew it could happen. So the growth was so exciting, um, not like the excitement of being shot out of a cannon as Shirley. I had 11 seasons to work on these incredible scripts. I had a diff different play every week, beautiful play every week, and the ability to continue to find things about her. So then they finally got around to writing an episode that every interview always wants to talk about. It's called The Nurses. And I have a confrontation with my nurses. And I reveal to them how lonely I am. And it's, it's a breakthrough for Margaret's character that we see. She, she says, you, you never even ask me in for a lousy cup of coffee. And I was going to say, at the risk of sounding like a fan, that line, I still remember when yeah. tearfully you said, why can't you? Yeah. Got a call. yeah. And so, so, so that is exciting. That's, um, and I, 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 I liked a lot of the television movies that I did. I did a film called Games Mother Never Taught You, uh, again playing a very strong uh, woman who um, made made a mark. You know, she was the first woman executive in this in this company. Um, we, we haven't come a long way, baby, but I think we're getting there. I think the uh, number Me Too is a um, major, major breakthrough for us. And, um, and also this, this, these hearings that are going on, not to get political, it has uh, really brought to the surface that women have been living in the margins for too long. Uh, Eleanor would, would be cheering here, Eleanor Roosevelt. I mean, she, we vote because of Eleanor Roosevelt. Yeah. We didn't have the vote. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, I, I think that um, what I'm, I'm most thrilled with uh, are the kinds of roles that I've been <coughs> offered and that I've had the opportunity to play because I think uh, I, I, I think they have shown the audience how developed and strong and wise and insightful and, and terrific women are if they're allowed to have a voice. And the nice thing is when you do a role, you've got the voice, you know. Yeah, you're, you're saying it, you're doing it. And um, uh, it's, uh, it's really, uh, I did another film, it was uh, called The First uh, the first feminist movie, it wasn't really, it was, I don't know, it was not very good, but my character was very well written, and it was, uh, it was that of a housewife who
who had four kids and um, with no life, was just always cleaning up and cooking and uh, and her husband was out playing golf and having martini lunches and you know just totally ignoring her and um, uh, it was uh, very very touching they they don't end up together and a lot of the reviews really really loved the character really loved what it showed about the the gumption of this woman with with everything that she was going to have to have to deal with she um, she she refused to continue like that I think Shirley is like that Shirley is in a loveless marriage and she she thinks about what it used to be like and she can't figure out why it can't be the same why why did what happened to us we were so in love and you know and she explores all of that in, in, a, in a very um, uneducated way. She's not an educated woman, but she has earth mother wisdom. She has, um, and uh, I love that about her. But, but anyway, in, in the end, she breaks free. And, uh, and Joe, her husband, who wouldn't go from here to there, is coming to Greece to bring her back. Well, again, she has evolved and changed so that it has affected everyone around her, like like her husband, like Joe. <laughs> and and I think but that's that's what it's all about. How uh, how we affect each other and bring each other in a positive way forward. Let's not let's not fall back. Let's keep going forward. And uh, I think um, just to, again to be political for one second, and Senator Flake, who, who took the time to be affected and said, we can afford to take another week. I'm, I'm, I'm undecided here, and it's ripping us apart. I mean, I, I love this man for, for, for standing up and saying that. And I am, um, hoping and praying that uh, uh, the women who are uh, who can't decide will put politics aside so that we can be gender proud anyway that's enough okay that elevator scene that, that you were was talking that, about that's yeah. wonderful that was a turning point yes a turning well point. he says yeah. not he said he was uh, deeply affected by a lot of things i don't i think certainly it, it meant something but I, I thought he got it when, uh, after screaming at them, literally, he said, thank you. And I thought, there's, there's great potential here, thank you. He, to, 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 I, what I get from that, you know, thank you for making me think, making me see, you know. Um, but women also uh, need uh, to to wake up those consciousness raising sessions there were women during the abzug um, uh, steinem period a lot of women out there didn't even know they were being abused they were just doing what what they were brought it's our dna this is this is how boys too they were grown up to they grew up to be in a certain way and we did the same thing and we make everything work we make, that's why we make great president because we make everything work. But the, 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 so so I don't I don't blame either gender. It's in our DNA. We're wise enough to recognize it. We can fix it. We can change it. We can do. We can keep going forward. And I I uh, I, I uh, think uh, Elizabeth Warren or Kamala. I mean those two gals. We should we should really really look them over and start thinking about that for our president. Oh, it's about time. Okay. Other questions? <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Hi. We do politics for a long time, but I'd like to get back to the theater for just a moment. We come sort of from a similar era. I worked with Bob Alton on uh, the Secret Honor. I came into New York as a teenager uh -huh. to work in the theater. Yeah. Today, if you were to come into New York today, put yourself back in that young lady in New Jersey. We don't have theater or film television. We have 
Netflix, we have Amazon, we have YouTube, we have so many more mediums available to us. And to me, I came to New York to be in the theater, you know, live. Uh, I see Broadway and opera ways become corporate and change dramatically. If you were to put yourself in that position, it's now 2018, a young lady coming in to be an actress. How do you look at those media? How do you look at internet and Netflix and Amazon? Well, very challenging, but I know what you mean about uh, theater and opportunities and uh, movies are kind of feeling the same way. You're right, we've got 500 channels and Netflix makes very good stuff. I, I, I wouldn't mind doing a movie uh, for them or, you know, um, and a, a, a few others, but, but mostly, um, it has cut into our opportunities on the stage. And now, I don't find the casting for stage all that open. You don't have those open calls anymore. You don't have, you know, we used to call them cattle calls. But they were, they were good. I mean, you went out there one by one and you sang your little heart out. Mostly, it was the only time you could get on stage and belt because you're not working. And so it was fun. But you were. Hmm? Now you're mic'd, which yes. drives me crazy. Oh, oh, yeah, I know. No, I have several. Uh, I, I, I wasn't mic'd for my first Broadway show, same time next year. We didn't have mics. And um, so I was, I was somewhere, Dallas, I think. The mics were dying. And I said, oh, hell, I project. I'm an actor. I don't need it. So, <laughs> so uh, I, 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 uh, but I, I, obviously got used to being liked and uh, of course if you're singing and dancing or acting at the same time, like Mame really needs to be liked. I mean she never stops. There are 15 changes, 15 costume changes and uh, usually while they're tearing off a wig or something and you just, you know, um, but, but it's fabulous. I mean who, would, who, would, who would, wouldn't want the opportunity to do that? So they have just different ways of looking at it. I'm crazy. There's somebody else who would say, oh, that's too much work. I had um, an actress, uh, I was doing Gooch, and she was playing Vera. And she said to me, if uh, I was, uh, Gooch opens the show, she's uh, singing um, Beekman Place with little Patrick. And the, at, at Rise, she, she sings. And, and Vera Charles said to me, darling, if anyone gives me a script and it says next to my character's name at Rise, I said, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> it terrified me. And Jean Sachs said to me, that bitch, she said that to you purposely. <laughs> <laughs> she wanted to make you a little crazy. Um, Maybe. That's not nice, but anyhow, uh, no, she, Jean, Jean, uh, she, she was uh, very temperamental. One day she stopped the rehearsal because there was no mirror on the top of the story where we came down the uh, beautiful staircase. She said, I've asked for a mirror time, and I'm ahead of it, and she's carrying on. And he says, darling, 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 whom did you ask? Uh, this is your property master. You must ask the property master. And then he said, all right, children, so it shouldn't be a total loss. We've stopped. Let's take five. You know, really? I don't think she got it, though. Yeah. So it shouldn't be a total loss that she has held up. Yeah, it's terrible. Not, not disciplined. Okay, um, what? So I hope that tells you. I mean, they, it, you have different challenges and different demands and, and different rewards. Do you know our camera operator on MASH? ruined a take a few times because he was laughing so hard the camera was shaking. That that's our audience, you know. And, and it was but it was like doing the theater in a way. Uh, because you um um yeah, I, I don't know it but but um we had that one rehearsal day that they actually filmed there's a, a DVD that you can buy called The Making of MASH and you can you can see the way we operated and worked together and, and, and just 
that the, you read through the script and the writers are taking notes or changing, and then you're talking, you say, you know, I wouldn't really say that. I wouldn't say it that way. I don't think. Gary, what do you think? Gary, you feel it's his line, really. And we, we never, it was the most amazing um, camaraderie. We, we didn't count lines. He has more lines or he has more scenes or something. MASH was the star, and that's why MASH was such a, is such a star. It's, it's, uh, and it's uh, timeless um, because it was honest. Anything that truthful and that honest. And they never stopped looking for um, stories. You know, many of the stories that we did as episodes came from a, a, a truth. Uh, we, we, did, we did an episode where we gave um, uh, rhinoplasty, which is Noah's job, to, to a, a, a soldier, it's against the, the rules, you don't do that. And we, we gave him a better nose, yeah. <laughs> and, that, and it was based on a true story. There was another beautiful story about a one-handed piano concerto. And um, I, know, uh, I know it well because my, my, now my gardener, he was my landscaper, gave it to me to give to them. And they did it, and my dear David Ogden Stiers, uh, it was on recently where he um, he worked with a soldier who had lost his, his arm and uh, was resisting. He was, his life was over and he was a pianist and now he's going to... And he brings him this music and he and we see him come to life literally again. And of course David, oh God, David. You know these actors that I work with, David on a weekend would go off somewhere and do King Lear. I mean he's like a, a fabulous incredible actor so and so I was I, I've been surrounded by some some wonderful wonderful actors just uh, and I think that makes a course that makes a big difference that show, well, and, uh, I just want you to know that show still brings me so much joy yeah. thank it. you what a great show what a great script what a great thing is it it just changes I can't watch the last episode without getting tearful. Oh, yeah. It's as simple as that. Do you know, I got a letter, our fan mail really should be published. I have this idea, just call it MASH Notes. Some of the, some of the fan mail. Uh, the, so just recently, just recently, this woman writes me a letter, and says, Ms. Swit, I have to thank you for saving my son's life. <laughs> I must have missed that. When did I do that, right? She said, my son came out of his room complaining of pains in his stomach. And she said, he came out walking the way Margaret Houlihan did when she had appendicitis. And uh, I remember how I walked. I remember the episode. So she said, I rushed him to the doctors. And I said, he has uh, appendicitis. I want you to get him in the hospital sweet and they I don't know whether they didn't do a rebound test or whatever but they were wrong they said no no it's not she said it is I want him in the hop she did a pull a hand she went swear hissy fitting I want him in the hospital and so they thought this is a crazy woman we would you know so they take him to the hospital it was such an emergency his trousers were dangling off his feet in in, in, in surgery in the oh, OR wow. they, they went slide in he was a sick puppy in the hospital for two weeks. They saved his life. She said, no, you did. And so I said, no, you did. I mean, she, she's a, so she said they came to her. This, this um, nurse came over to get details because it, it was so rushed. Uh, the nurse said, how were you so convinced? What convinced you that it was appendicitis? And she told her. She said, and she's telling me in this, in this letter, she said, he walked the way you did when you left your tap tent. You had your, your your hand in a fist, pressing on your right side, favoring your left, and that's the way my, my son walked out. And I said, that's what it is? I, And she, she said, I don't know how actors, I mean, how did you know to do that? But uh, she said, that's what convinced me. And I told the nurse, and the nurse said, you saved his life. Oh. And so I said, and I have this letter. Can you imagine getting a letter from a woman I will never meet? I'd love to meet the boy. Yeah. Nice. Sir, you had a question. Hi, Loretta. Hi. Jim. Hi. 
I, uh, so that'll be your third book. There'll be MASH notes. There'll be uh, <laughs> Sweetheart 1 and 2 and then MASH notes. I hope so. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, that's a great story. <laughs> but you think it's a good idea? I, I think, think it's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really. So my favorite, we used to hang things on the bulletin board because you really, if it was something they wrote to you, you wanted to share it with your family. Uh, one of the last uh, things uh, just before we wrapped was a telegram. And it said, Dear MASH folk, thank you. You made me laugh. You made me cry. You made me feel. Thank you. And for me, that said it all. Feelings. Uh, Patty Chayeski wrote this beautiful piece on feelings. He said, at a certain point, you stop feeling. You're numb. You watch early morning news, and there's news at 12, 1, 2 o'clock, 3, 5 o'clock, news at 5, news at 11. By the time you see the repetition, you are numb. You have cut your feelings off, and you don't feel anything. And you can't do that to yourself. What happens if you don't feel? You're dead. Right. That's it. You, you feel nothing. You're dead. And so when she said that, I, I thought it was the ultimate compliment that we made people feel things. They weren't afraid to feel things. They trusted us. I mean, we, we babysat families. Uh, they weren't afraid for their kids to see us. And then they passed us along to their kids and their kids' kids and their kids' kids' kids. And the other day, um, I, I got a, a fan letter on lined paper written in pencil. Now, you have to know he was 16. He was 14, I think. He was 14. <clears throat> and and I'm sure if, if, if it's still going, when he's a, a father and a husband, he's going to have his kids watch MASH. <coughs> it just um, it, it was a, a phenomenon. The great, the producers, the writers, and then this this um, this bonding, this clique we had over the years, with the, even with the many changes. It. Uh, it withstood time and, and yes. everything. Still does. Still does. <laughs> Anyone else has a question? Anyone else have any? Well, so, actually, oh, oh, I, oh I, I made a comment. You just oh. beautifully went into it. But my question, which will segue greatly into what you just said, uh, how long did it take for you to build that relationship working in the show? Because I'm sure they came in with, this is the show, you're cast, you're working with these people, right? You're, you've got the groundwork laid out. How Hello. long did it take for you From to Hello. I'm sorry? We were just connected. You just went. From Hello. That's awesome. We, uh, and Wayne and I used to lo laugh about it. Uh, we were doing a, a summer show with uh, light, lightweight uh, clothing. The boys were in their Hawaiian outfits. And, and it was freezing. It was outdoors. And we're at the Fox Ranch, they called it. And it was five in the morning or six in the morning. It was freezing. Wayne was blue. He he had a, a little dribble on his nose that had frozen. I mean, we were we were freezing. So in order to stay as warm as we could, we huddled and hugged, and the body warmth. And I said to Wayne, I'm convinced that that's what did it. That's why we got so we we you 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 right there. You, you get very close to somebody. But no, I think. Also, we respected the material, the material, and and I once walked to the dailies, uh, the, the the rushes, the dailies that you see every day, uh, behind Alan and Wayne, and they were still rehearsing a scene that we shot yesterday. <laughs> that the the care, the thinking that went into it was palpable. I mean, it was just very exciting, and I I saw I caught up to them. I said, "Excuse me, fellas." That that was that, that's finished. You don't you don't you don't you don't have to. And and they laughed, but they were still trying to work out this thing that maybe they didn't get. I mean, I've had uh, we look at each other. Alan would look at me after taking and say, "What's that?" And I'd say, "Yeah, it was good. It was good." Yeah, you know, I mean, we would. There was no. I don't know. It's yeah. yeah and we always, our big joke is, you had to be there. We <laughs> cannot. None of us. We cannot explain the magic that happened.
to know. Yes, my girlfriend wants to know something. Well, I just have to say that you underplay some of your many talents because you're also a fantastic jewelry designer. But uh, as the proud owner of three copies of these books, one you signed to my parents, one you signed to me, one you signed to, oh, I forget. But um, it's one of your many it's a, lovers. It is a house. gorgeous, yes, one of my many lovers. <laughs> I have to hide the book now. Um, but anyway, it, it, it is just a gorgeous, gorgeous book. But you said something earlier that I, that I, and you've taught me so much just as a friend, and I, I, and I love and adore you, and you know that. But we, with regard to discipline equals freedom, I will say I was honored, this is years ago now, when you were working on um, Eleanor. And I would come up to when you were living over, you know, 66 Street at a time to help her rehearse for that. I, as an actress myself, I've done this on numerous occasions with friends, but this was a magnificent, oh my God, she blew me away. And we're talking, she was walking around and feeding her dog while we were running lines, right? But there would be times, I swear, she taught me so much, where I would be reading lines with her. I mean, I'm, I'm just really reading the script because it's a one-person show, and I'm going through, and then she would stop me, and I'm, it may not have been exactly this, but talk about the discipline. Lorette would say, stop. On the last page, after the third line down, was there an ellipsis after that? <laughs> and I'm like, oh shit, I missed it. And you're like, well, let's go back. And I'm like, damn, if she's not good. How annoying. <laughs> it wasn't annoying at all. It was such an honor, and you did such a brilliant job. So I was she's so great to help. But you, my your script. book is fantastic, and it's so lovely. I love my book. I love my book. It's and beautiful. I, uh, I, yes, Tell I do. Tell us about your aunt, the animals, the, the service you do for animals. Oh, right. Well, um, I told you my charity is Sweetheart Animal, uh, Animal uh, Alliance. I'm trying to bond, uh, put together alliances with other groups that do like work. And uh, right now, I have a project called Comrades in Arms, and I'm trying to help the military bring the uh, teams, the canine teams, uh, from Afghanistan. So, so it's. Uh, it's more than, and we are animals, we're, we're human animals, and they're teamed with animal animals, and I've seen pictures of the bonding that the, that the soldiers, uh, or the military have with these, these animals. I saw a picture just recently of, um, of um, a soldier on a cot, he was just splayed out, and the dog was like a blanket, just lying on it, and they were taking a nap. Uh, I, I've seen a picture of a dog lying over the grave of his partner, and the dog looks like it's going to just die. And I've also, uh, I know stories of their courage, or, you know, the dogs walk through fields testing where the mines are. I mean, I, I can go on and on. They, they, uh, they, They've even tried to categorize how many lives uh, the dogs have saved. Finally, the dog, dogs have received, a dog has received the highest uh, honor uh, that the military gives. Um, his handler, who was captured, and the, the, his partner signaled him to go away and get help. And the dog disappeared. He was put in a shack kind of thing. Uh, there was another prisoner there. They were tied to hold. And the dog came back, attacked the guard, killed him, ripped his throat out, threw his heavy body against the door, opened the door, untied his buddy, buddy untied the other guy, and off they went. That's a true story. Uh, it it uh, just, uh, I watch. I call him my centerfold. Chris, Chris Bennett is a Marine who came back without two legs. A, it was a night uh, action, so Harley, his dog, was not with him. Uh, when, when he uh, was wounded, the medic who was close by was also wounded, and the medic's back was destroyed. So Chris was out without morphine for several hours. I tell you that part so that you appreciate the pain he has waiting for seven months for his partner, Harley. That 
for his memory in Afghanistan, he said, those seven months waiting for my dog wow. were the, the most mm -hmm. painful months of my life. He just became a father, and, uh, and I call it my centerfold because I'm going to be doing a lot of events, and I'm flying him in with Harley, and uh, we're going to talk about why we're raising the money um, to subsidize what it takes to bring back the teams together. Mm -hmm. Or just the dogs, if we can bring back five or six at a time, they have, there are over 2,000 dogs that have been left behind. Oh. Various reasons, I don't want to put a knock on the military, some budget, but uh, Obama, thank God, has put in a law covering the expenses and it just needs to be enacted. And uh, so we're, we're making headway, we're making great strides. And, um, but, but uh, so that's kind of what I'm up to. Uh, but I work with, <coughs> with uh, all different uh, uh, types of, of uh, organizations. Uh, there's a, a, an old shelter uh, in um, St. Peter's, St. Augustine. I'm on the board there, and uh, most of those animals can't be placed anymore, uh, and so we just take care of them. Same thing with Wildlife Way Station. They're mostly exotic. You can't release. A white tiger uh, in California. So, so they live their lives out with us with serenity, respect, love, care. Um, <clears throat> Farm Sanctuary. <coughs> Farm Sanctuary uh, tries to uh, to help and, and uh, care for farm animals who have run away, have escaped death. But mostly, we try to uh, work on bettering the situation with farm factories um, it's, um, and we, we've done we've done a lot of good work a lot of made a lot of really good changes and um, we just if we're going to call ourselves civilized we can't continue to use machines like a deep beaker so that you can squeeze more more chickens into a cage most of them die of trauma. I mean, they, you know, it's, it's horrible. But uh, ho hopefully we're moving forward and, and some of those things will become a thing of the past that we'll look back on and say, how did we ever do that? How did we do that? Well, we also had slaves. How did we ever do that? How did we ever treat another human being like that? So um, I heard somebody say the other day, uh, we really need to know that very often we're just stumbling around in the dark. But that's okay, as long as we continue to stumble, we'll find the light. Yeah. Here's to Speedy, uh, whatever we made us think of. One little past last piece of business. When we found out you were going to speak with us tonight uh, at our meeting of the Lambs Board, which is what we call the Council, the council voted to make you, in recognition for your life in theater and film and television, and for your charitable work on behalf of animals, you are hereby declared Aww. an honorable lamb. <laughs> Right? Cool. 